Thank you for joining me for part 8 of our current study called Wife versus Female. Now, originally I thought that perhaps this would be the concluding segment. However, I decided to break it up, uh, this last segment, into two shorter segments. And, you know, perhaps that's best so as to be able to give proper consideration to what remains to be looked at without it being a, a really long sitting. And so, with that being said, uh, there should be just one more segment to the study. Now, this segment is entitled, In the Beginning, Azar. And this word Azar is a Hebrew word. And as we're going to see in this segment, this word Azar reveals something very significant to our current study. Now, that's because over the last seven segments, what we've been talking about is what Scripture actually says about women in general, as well as what Scripture actually says about women in the covenant of marriage. Whether that is the marriage covenant between a man and woman, or the marriage covenant between Messiah and his bride, which is the body of Messiah, made up of men and women according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, united as one body in Messiah, where our spiritual identity is neither male nor female, while we all function as one body and bride of Messiah by means of the gifts of the Spirit as designated by Elohim, Elohim or God, and administered by the head of the body, our Messiah, Yahusha, who some call Jesus. And so it is that we've been looking at what Scripture says about what that should look like in in ministry. And what we've found is that contrary to religious tradition, men are not the favored bride of Messiah. Because there are no two brides where one has favored status. Yah tells us that he is no respecter of persons. And we see that in Romans 2, verse 11. And that there is no male or female in Messiah. We see that in Galatians 3, verses 28 to 29. And all of Scripture and the history of mankind speaks of the character of the Most High and and shows us that He means what He says. And so, what does the Most High say about His creation of mankind, both male and female? Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28. Then Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. So, Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Elohim blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and every creature that crawls upon the earth. End of quote. 
Now, this is a, a well-known passage in Scripture, but let's give some careful consideration to what is being said. In the first line, we see the word man, and it's underlined, and it is the, uh, the word Adam, Strong's number H120. And this is not the personal name for the male called Adam. We do see the personal name for Adam later on in, in uh, just a couple of chapters over. But um, here in this place, this is not the personal name for the male called Adam. Instead, it's the name for all of mankind. Uh, male and female, as we can even see um, in the English words, female has the word male in it, and woman has the word man in it, because they share the same source. And so, as we read um, that first statement, we are given to know that the Most High created mankind, male and female, to rule over the realm of the Most High's creation, which consists of land, sea, and air, and all the hosts thereof, uh, the livestock, fish, and birds. That realm of existence is what Solomon called under the sun. And that's in Ecclesiastes 1.9. Now, in the next place that is underlined, we see that Elohim tells us that he blessed them, meaning that he blessed mankind, male and female, and said to them, male and female, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that crawls upon the earth." End of quote. Now, there are three things we want to make note of that um, have been said here. Two, perhaps three. Number one. Going back to the top of the page, the Most High said that He made mankind, male and female, in His image, after His likeness. And you know, that's really important to understand because that signifies that the Most High designed mankind, male and female, with the same capacity to hear his voice. Why is it important to hear the Most High's voice? Well, because mankind is not an autonomous being. Just because we're given freedom of choice does not mean that we're not still subject to he who created and commanded that his will be done in the realm where his creation was placed. And so mankind, male and female, were created and made to hear and obey the voice of the Most High so as to jointly rule over the realm they were assigned to. And we see that here in Genesis chapter 1. And so this gives us um, insight and understanding into what is said to us in Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 to 17. So let's look at that. 
And Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. If you if you um, are looking at the screen, we're looking at the the bottom portion for Genesis 2 verses 15 to 17. So again, let's let's start from the beginning there. And Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Yahuwah Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. End of quote. So we see here further evidence that Adam, which again is the Hebrew word for mankind, male and female, Adam heard this command, not with physical ears, but with their spirit, which is the way that we hear and receive guidance today. It's not with our physical ears, but with our spirit. And we see that in Romans 1.9, where the uh, Apostle Paul says that we serve with our spirit. And so, at the tree, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam's wife was deceived, as we're told in 1 Timothy 2.14, but that does not mean that she did not know, but rather deceived means that she was lured or seduced to disobey. And her husband who was with her was in agreement and he partook of the decision to disobey. And therefore Romans 5.12 says that Adam male and female sinned and thereby sin entered into the world now the good news is that 1 Corinthians 15:45 gives to us to know that the last Adam our Messiah Yahusha was sent to the earth with his bride in him so as to restore the Most High's creation to his intents and purposes so that we co-reign with the husband of our souls, Messiah, Yahusha, while being empowered by his grace to the renewing of our minds and to the glory or esteem and honor of the name Yahusha. For indeed, Yahuwah saves, which is exactly what Messiah Yahusha's name means. Yahuwah, the name of the Father, saves. Hallelujah. Which brings us to point number two. And point number two takes us back to Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28, where again, we want to make note that the Most High again said to them, Adam, male and female, mankind, the first Adam, the first man to subdue and rule over the earth and not over each other. And in order to rule, one must be able to hear and obey. And so this command to rule was given to them, which explains 
why in the Most High's restoring of his creation through the last Adam, the gift of the Spirit, the Ruach Kadesh, the Holy Spirit, was absolutely necessary in being able to hear and obey with our spiritual ear, which is evidence that the Most High's original intention for his creation has not changed. First Samuel 15 verse 29 Moreover, the strength of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. End of quote. And so in, in this segment, we will continue to look at the witness of the word of the Most High made manifest in the lives of believers. Because when we say what he says and act accordingly, his name, which is his character and authority, is glorified or made manifest. Hallelujah and amen. And so, over the past seven segments of of study, what has been confirmed to us is this, and that is that what is revealed to us is not as easily seen when only reading the surface text of any given translation of Scripture, whether it's uh, King James Version, New American Standard, Sefer, etc., And each of these and others do have their own advantages. However, there are some things that are more easily revealed by means of word studies of the original text. Because as we've been discussing, over the past 2,000 years, much understanding of scripture has been lost and the translation bias of the many translators of scripture. But thankfully, Ruach Kadesh, the Holy Spirit, leads us and enables us and teaches us as scripture interprets scripture. And you know, one of the ways that scripture interprets scripture is in the patterns of truth that we see in scripture. So let's take a look at um, two passages, uh, the two passages that we have here on the screen. Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Messiah and the called out assembly. End of quote. And here we have Genesis 2.24 that Paul just um, quoted. So... In our last segment, we read Ephesians 5, and here again, we are looking at it now. The emissary, or Apostle Paul, is quoting Genesis 2, 24, and by means of Ruach Kadesh, or the Holy Spirit, Paul gives to us to know that what was first spoken to us in Genesis not only speaks about the covenant relationship between a husband and wife, uh, where the in, uh, intended nature and purpose of their relationship is that the two become one flesh, but also what is revealed to us is that there is a profound mystery pertaining to Messiah and his bride becoming one that is illustrated for us in the relationship between the natural husband and wife. 
This mystery has existed from creation so as to progressively be revealed to us, most especially on this side of the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah Yahusha. Because both the wife of the natural man and the bride of Messiah have need of the helper. Ruach Kadesh, or the Holy Spirit, because the position of wife was called to serve as a position of the distribution of the power of the helper, the Ruach Kadesh in the family of mankind, a distribution that enabled the wife to co-reign with her husband over the fish of the sea, etc., just as the Bride of Messiah is now enabled with the Helper, the Ruach Kadesh, and shall in the full manifestation of the Kingdom of Messiah co-reign with our husband, Messiah Yahusha. Even in the Old Testament, the Most High said that he was a husband to Israel, which made Israel his bride. The Most High was speaking of the spiritual nature of the relationship between himself and his people. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. That word favor makes reference to empowering grace. So finds favor or empowering grace from Elohim. And the Bride of Messiah, male and female, is empowered by the Helper, the Ruah Kadesh, the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 47. So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven, end of quote. And so we see here stated for us that the natural precedes the spiritual. Just as was being said to us in Ephesians 5. And here in 1 Corinthians, Paul by the Ruach Kadesh, the Holy Spirit, is again explaining that the natural man, Adam, preceded the spiritual man, Adam, our Messiah, the last Adam, who, like the first Adam, has a bride. Now, there are, of course, other examples of how in Scripture the natural precedes the spiritual, which we could perhaps do a separate video on. But the pattern that we see in Scripture is that the Most High uses these references to illustrate invisible spiritual truths by pointing to that which is observable of the function and purpose of the natural objects. First Corinthians 10 verse 11 Now these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And then there's Romans 15 4 
for everything that was written in the past was written for our instruction so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope end of quote and so we see that the most high's pattern of using natural things to reveal spiritual truths which when revealed benefits us through teaching and instructing us in truth we've recorded for um, we have recorded for us where Messiah used natural material objects 43 times in the telling of parables so as to reveal spiritual realities and truth principles Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, Elohim's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from his workmanship, so that men are without excuse. End of quote. And so, here again, we see that invisible qualities of the Most High, his, his eternal power and divine nature, which is spiritual and invisible, is revealed to us by his workmanship, his creation of that which is natural and material. Which brings us to our key word for this portion of our study. Our key word again, Azar. We will look at the meaning of this word as rendered in the concordances and lexicons, and then as well look at it in the context of various scripture verses. Uh, we'll then move on so as to gain and confirm some understanding of what is revealed to us in the pattern of these scripture verses. So let's begin. Azar is Strong's number H5828. Now, originally, this word Azar was composed of two root words. One meant power and the other strength. In Strong's Concordance, uh, the meaning is listed as to aid or help. And it comes from a root word which means to surround so as to protect or aid to provide assistance and support in times of hardship and distress. The ancient Hebrew lexicon renders the definition as an action word meaning to wrap, cover, or encircle an object. Now let's look at a few verses where this word appears so as to see the meaning of this word in context. Let's see, let's see here. It makes note here at the top of our, our slide that this word, Azar, appears uh, 22 times in 21 verses um, in the Hebrew text. And we've listed just a few. Let's start with Psalms 12, I'm sorry, Psalms 121. Uh, verses 1 to 2. I will lift up my eyes to the hills or the mountains from where shall my help come. My help comes from Yahuwah who made heaven and earth. And so we see here um, this, verse, uh, this word help 
appears twice in this verse, this one verse, in Psalm 121. And again, the strong number H5828. Um, Exodus 18, verse 4. The other was named Eleazar, for he said, The Elohim of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And so here we see that word Azar uh, appearing in within someone's name, Eleazar, as we can see underlined here. And so this this man's name, Eleazar, um, his name actually means Elohim, or El, is my help. And so uh, if we broke it down, that's exactly what we see is those two words in that, in that name. That's the meaning of his name. And there are several other names as well that are uh, given in scripture where Azar is a part of the name. Um, Deuteronomy 33 verse 7 And this regarding Judah or Yahuda. So he said, Hear, O Yahuwah, the voice of Yahuda, and bring him to his people. With his hands he contended for them, and may you be a help against his adversaries. End of quote. And then there's Psalm 115, verse 9. O Israel, trust in Yahuwah. He is their help and their shield. End of quote. And so let's read a few more. Um, and let's pay attention to the context so as to allow scripture in a multitude of places to tell us what this word means. So let's look at a few of the other instances uh, where this word help or helper is used. We won't look at all of them, but we will look at a few more. Deuteronomy 33 verse 29 Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahuwah, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies will cringe before you and you will tread upon their high places. And then there's Psalm 20, verse 2. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for Yahuwah. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am afflicted and needy. Hasten to me, O Elohim, you are my help and my deliverer, O Yahuwah, do not delay. End of quote. And so, something that we see in these verses uh, is that they all have in common that they're speaking of the power to assist someone who is in need of tremendous help. And in the most in most of these verses, if not all, the person who is providing the help is the Most High Himself, providing help to His people as a matter of covenant. So now let's look at the first mention of this word Azar because uh, there is something um, there is a Bible study principle that's called uh, the Law of First Mention. And this Law of First Mention suggests that the first time that a concept, a theme, or a word appears in Scripture, it holds a foundational truth and sets a precedent for its further development later on in, 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 uh, throughout the text. So. Let's consider that principle of uh, 
have the law of first mention as we look at this word Azar. Genesis or Barashit 2 verse 18 Then Yahuwah Elohim said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then the very next time, after the first time that we see this word help, um, H5828, is just two verses down from Genesis 2.18, and because we see it in Genesis 2.20. And let's read that. The man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. End of quote. Now, prior to this slide, we just looked at a number of verses where this same word, Azar, appears. And in every place where we looked at this word as it is used in other places um, after these two verses, the word Azar is used in such a way as to speak of a significantly powerful act of help that came as a matter of covenant from the Most High to His people. So with that in mind, if we were to apply the Bible study principle called the law of first mention to the Hebrew word Azar, as it appears for the first time in scripture in Genesis 2.18, please tell me, is Genesis 2.18 what you would expect to see? And so, I ask you to be honest and say out loud, have you ever heard it taught or have you ever in your own heart thought of the word translated as helper here in Genesis 2 verses 18 and 20 as a position of delegated power to help in such a way as empowered by the Most High? And so again, if we were to apply the Bible study principle called the law of first mention to Genesis 2.18 and then consider the verses we read throughout scripture, do we see how translation bias and religious tradition serve one another? even more important to be mindful of when we remember that no matter what version we find that we lean towards, it is simply a translation of an original text. And there are a number of translations. In fact, there are approximately 900 English versions or English translations of the Bible. And one of the reasons that there are so many different translations is that some of the differences in translation actually serve uh, the narrative or the, the bias of a, a certain religious group. And that word bias is, is defined by um, the dictionary is a disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or thing, usually in a way that is inaccurate, close-minded, prejudicial, or showing prejudice, or unfair. And 
You know, we know that uh, as well that translation bias is not random. Translation bias serves a, a purpose or agenda. Translation bias serves the furtherance of the religious uh, traditions of people and organizations which seek to serve themselves rather than serving the Most High. And we saw examples of this written about in Scripture when we were told to guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herod, and the heart attitude that Paul spoke against in 1 Corinthians 1.12, where Paul cited how some were saying, I am with Paul, or I am with Apollos, or I am with Cephas, Peter. Well, today we hear, I am with the Baptists, or I am with the Catholics, or I am with the Mormons, etc. When only Messiah died for us, that we may receive the unadulterated word that makes us free to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, when we allow scripture to interpret what kind of help the Most High designed for the wife to be to her husband, we see a very different picture from that which is promoted by the narrative of religious tradition. And we see a very different vision for what scripture says about the position of help that the Bride of Messiah serves in. And perhaps we see a different view for what happened at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we will look at that as well. But first, there's another word that we want to look at in uh, these two verses. And that is the word that is translated into English here as suitable. Now, this Hebrew word has also been translated as mate or meat in some, in some versions. So, let's look at this word. And this word is connecto. It's Strong's number H5048. And this word is made up of two prepositions, uh, the first of which is the ke, key or k, which suggests corresponding to, or uh, the adding of something that is essential. And then the second preposition that's a part of this word is nekdo, which suggests to stand in someone's presence. Now, Hebrew linguists say that the literal meaning of this word, made up of two prepositions, expresses a relationship between two people facing each other, showing that they are equals. Now, this snippet was taken from the Bible Hub online lexicon, and this snippet shows how these two words were translated for this verse in Genesis 2.18. As we can see on top, we see the word Azar translated as helper, and this is the word that we just looked at in the several other verses. Um, to see how the same word was translated in, in other places. So let's now look at the second word and, and the phrase, uh, the word kanego. And I'm probably mispronouncing that.
And so um, here we have Strong's number H5048. It's um, the same word that we just looked at. Um, it's the latter part of that word, the neko part. And um, it's um, coded with the same H5048. And um, we see that this word appears 151 times in 143 verses in the Hebrew. And so remember the, the KE um, has to do with um, corresponding to. But uh, we're looking at the latter part of that word, nego. And um, so in Genesis 21, verse 16, it's translated with the word opposite. Let's read that. Then she went and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away. For she said, Do not let me see the boy die. And she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. Genesis 31, 32 The one with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what is yours among my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Genesis 31:37. Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. And then Genesis 33:12. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey and go, and I will go before you. End of quote. And so, this is the part of that word that has to do with um, proximity. Uh, and so we see that it's um, in each one of these verses, the word is uh, translated as either opposite or presence, in the presence of, or before, etc. So, uh, again, this is um, Strong's number H5048, and it's been translated in Genesis 2.18 as either suitable or mate, or meat, depending on the version. Uh, King James uh, translated as, translates it as meat, um, and as in help meet and the New American Standard translates this word as mate uh, um, I'm sorry suitable so it's either suitable uh, a helper that is suitable or it is a help meet so what we see in other places in Scripture is that this uh, word that is translated as suitable or meet is being translated as opposite or in the presence of or before. So let's take a look at a few more verses. Genesis 47:15. When the money was all in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said give us food for why should we die in your presence for our money is gone um, Exodus 19 2 when they set out from Rephidim they came to the wilderness wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. 
Deuteronomy 32:52, For you shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I am giving the sons of Israel. And 1 Kings 8:22, Then Solomon stood before the altar of Yahuwah in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. End of quote. So now let's look at the root word that this word has been drawn from. And so again, we see here um, Strong's number H5048. And um, it is a word that um, this part of the, the phrase that we're looking at in Genesis 2.18, this is the part of the phrase that is generally translated as suitable or mate or meet. And it is... Um, it is uh, the strong number uh, H5048 or Neged uh, to stand in someone's presence is the second part of that um, combination of two words that is used in Genesis 2.18. Uh, the first part is the K-E or key. And that part of that word means corresponding to or adding something essential. And so when you put it all together, uh, in as much as that word that is commonly translated as suitable or meet, um, what we see in this word is um, corresponding to or adding something that is essential to someone who is standing in their presence. The root word uh, to this word is, um, is a verb and it's Strong's number 5046 and it means to tell. Uh, to announce or to declare. And there's something interesting about that that we may um, take a look at in, in the next part of, of this or the next segment of this study. But in any case, it, it certainly seems to suggest that since that um, standing in someone's presence uh, is that word is drawn from the idea of telling, announcing, or declaring. There's there's some significance to that. And there's another word that we can look at that actually um, does the same thing. And so we're going to look at including that in the next part of the study, the next segment of our study. And so when we piece together the meanings that we were able to gather, we see that the phrase Azar Konegdo, uh, that has commonly been translated as help meet, because now we've added that word Azar to the Konegdo. Um, when we look at that phrase Azar Konegdo, that has commonly been translated as help meet or help or suitable helper um, what we're doing is that as we look at the literal translations of, of those words perhaps this could more accurately be translated as so as to say uh, that the wife or bride is to be a help 
that corresponds to her husband. And what is important to keep in mind is what kind of help the wife or bride is designed to be, having been designed by the Most High to be such. Because we must remember that this same word is also used in the majority of verses that contain this word, and it's used to describe the Most High as He powerfully helps His people. And so, by design, Ruach Kadesh, or the Holy Spirit, is to be the source of that essential power delegated to the natural wife or spiritual bride of Messiah. And the substance of the help is the same Holy Spirit. And so one could say equal and the essence of or the substance of the power. However, we must remember that there is order in the administering of the power in the kingdom. And we spoke some on this in the last segment of study. Uh, so if you missed the last segment of the study, part seven, I believe it is, um, is where we talked about headship. And so uh, that would certainly be something that you would want to watch if, if you've not done so. But um, we spoke about this in the last segment and we will continue on this note in the next segment of our study. So, until then, Hen Ushalom Mishpaka, favor and peace, family. Please do join me as we continue in our studies.